Hello, 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 hello. Uh, it's Dr. Punch uh, with Prepare STL coming to you all live with Facebook Live. And we just want to spend a little bit of time um, talking and giving voice to some concerns and some questions that oftentimes do not get the voice and concern that they deserve to get. So um, again, I'm, I'm Dr. Punch. I am a trauma surgeon and surgeon and founder of the T, a community of health working to reduce the impact of trauma in the St. Louis region. And COVID is definitely part of the trauma we've been through in this last year and a half. Before we get any further into this, I just want um, Azaria and Luke to tell us a little bit about themselves. So why don't you start, Luke? Yeah, so my name is Azaria, but people call me Z. Um, I am a now senior at Whitmer High School, and I'm part of different organizations, like the Youth Advisory Board for Alive and Well, and now working with Prepare SDL. So, yeah. I'm Luke Sewell. Uh, I'm also going to be a senior at Ladue High School. Uh, I have a lot of little cousins who are also wondering probably the same type of questions that we're going to be asking, just generally about COVID and the variants, and so I'm just happy to be a part of that. Okay, so, so y'all are both seniors, um, and you basically went through then your junior year in the midst of this yeah. pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> so you have felt it deeply, and even as you're planning to end your time in high school, I can imagine the impact has been huge. So, you know, let's get right into it. I think we're going to start with you, your first question. Yeah, well, my first question is, what is the general difference between COVID-19 and the Delta variant? Okay, so, first of all, COVID-19 is a virus. Um, and a virus is a really weird bug in its ability to cause us to be sick because it's not really completely alive. It's a package of genetic information wrapped in a layer of fat that goes through the air and through our secretions and gets into our eyes, nose, and mouth, and then attaches to the lining of our respiratory tract, injects its genetic information into our cells, and then uses our cells to reproduce and make copies of itself because since it's a virus, it doesn't actually have all the machinery it needs to be alive, get energy, and reproduce itself. See, that's really, really important to understand about the virus to begin with because viruses are basically like zombies. They're not really alive, and that makes them really hard to kill. And so your immune system has to recognize them, attack them and pull them out, you know, zombie killer style, to really get rid of them. So that's the original COVID. Now last, what was it, uh, fall we got really uh, worried about a variant that came up in the UK. And that variant is now called the Alpha variant. The Alpha variant was 50% times, or 50% better at doing all the stuff I just talked about. Better at spreading and creating infection and other people than the original COVID. Now the Delta variant, this newest variant, is 50 times better than that. Yeah. And so basically, just like your iPhone, it's getting better and better and better at doing what it does. Unfortunately, what it does is cause really serious infection in our bodies that's really hard to fight unless we have a strong immune system. And that's what's so different. So it used to be, when we talked about coronavirus, if one person got the infection, they could spread it to two people, about. Now, if one person gets Delta, they can spread it to three or four people. And y'all are, you know, I don't know how you feel about math. Are you, are you mad at people? I like math. math. But look, look, like, you know, if you jump by two every time, it's one thing. You jump by four every yeah. time. Suddenly now, so we're, what we're looking at in the United States is that 50% of cases in the United States are now the Delta variant, and there are places like Missouri where it's totally taking over the kinds of uh, in infections that are causing people to have to end up in the hospital. So basically, it's the same thing. It just has small changes in its genetic code that make it much better at causing the infection and spreading and infecting other people. Well, I guess that sort of answers my next question that I had as a follow-up is wondering why the Delta variant is so much more dangerous than you said, just because it's, it multiplies essentially yeah. its power and how many people 
get infected from it versus just the regular COVID-19. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty interesting. I didn't know it was that much more powerful to branch off to that many more people. Yeah, so it's interesting because I told you that a virus is basically a package of genetic information. It don't have a mouth. It doesn't have a little power machine that makes energy. It can't reproduce itself. It's really just... Is like it's it's just like a recipe, and a box to hold the recipe in. It's not very exciting, except for once it gets your body to reproduce itself, it can do a lot of serious things. But the outside of that package, the outside of that lining, has got a protein on it. It's called the spike protein, and it's almost like a little tiny needle on the outside of the virus that's really good at sticking, and then allowing the uh, sticking to a cell in your body and then allowing it to inject its genetic information into the cell causing the infection. Where the change, what's, the change in the Delta variant is in that spike protein. So it's kind of like maybe we used to have shoes, you know, with, with laces and now uh, it went the Velcro and now it's just slip on. I mean, it's just there. It's just on you like you're not getting away from it. And because of that, um, it's, like we said, much better at causing serious infection. So, Dr. Klein, let me ask you this. Why should I even get the vaccine if I'm still able to catch and spread COVID? Okay, so really, really good question. First of all, let me just ask you a question back. What do you think a vaccine is? Um, just a way to pretty much protect your body, but uh -huh. that's about it. Sometimes you can just avoid people or do whatever you need to and you don't even need a vaccine, you know? Okay, so very, very good question. So we already we already established the idea that this Delta variant spreads easier. And so, yes, the first step is still going to be wear a mask, like we're sitting here wearing masks, keeping distance, clean hands, and supporting your immune system. That means really, really basic things to keep you healthy. Eat, sleep, manage your stress, and do uh, get the proper vitamins in to support your immune health, including vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin D. So all that stuff is still totally true. So why do you need to mess with a vaccine, and what does a vaccine actually really do? Right? That's the question. Because you're right, there are a lot of people who have successfully protected themselves from infection up to now. You are doing those things, and they're really great, important things. They are like, they're, 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 they're not hard to do in this certain, I mean, they're sort of hard to do, but they're easy to do at the same time. Okay, so the vaccination is basically taking um, a copy of that recipe just for a little piece of the virus. And the piece is the spike protein. So in other words, you're taking a copy of the piece of the code, the part of the recipe, that's for making the spike protein, okay? And then that gets packaged in a little package of fat, very similar to a virus, but it's only part of the story, just part of the information. And that can get injected into your muscle. That is what an mRNA vaccine is. mRNA is a way of describing genetic information that tells your cell's machinery how to make a protein. It's the code for that protein, the recipe for that thing. And so you're injecting a little piece of that specific protein code into your body. Your body sees it and says, hey, there's some genetic information. I feel like I should turn that into the recipe that it calls for. I want to make the protein that that goes to. So your body does it. Your body makes the protein. It takes the recipe and says, let's make this soup, you know? And then you've got little pieces of just a piece of coronavirus in your body. The, the genetic information doesn't last very long. So it's not like it keeps making, it keeps making, it keeps making it, just for a short period of time. So then your body's like, wait, I know I just made this, but this is not me. This is from the south side and I'm over here. Like, this is not a part of who I am. And so it recognizes it, tags it with protein, a different protein, and allows your body to get rid of it through its immune system. Then your body is really good at remembering events like that. It's kind of like the bouncer at the, 
at the party. It's like, I've seen that hat and that hoodie before. You're out of here. I know you're a troublemaker, right? So the next time your body sees that protein, like for instance, if you get a booster shot, a second shot, it creates an even bigger response. That's why people have symptoms when they get the second shot of the vaccine. And then, from that point on, you have six months, 12 months, 18 months. We don't honestly know past 12 months how long it lasts, so that's true. You have coverage, you have protection, and your immune system is ready to fight already if any piece of that protein shows up. So why do you need to go through all that? Why do you need some genetic information in your body that's not yours? Why do you have to have an immune response? Why do you have to mess with all of it? Well, it's a choice and a decision that only you can make. Because you're right, that's the whole process. That's the whole situation. You're doing something to your body. There's a couple reasons, though, in, uh, that I would think that you sh would want to think about as you make your choice. One is, is there anything in my health and in my risk factors that make it so I might get COVID really bad even though I'm like young and healthy? Or, even more, even more, there are there people around me that if I brought it home to them, or I was hanging with them and I was the reason why they got it, even though I wasn't that sick, could I handle that? And I guess the last thing is, why does anybody do something for the greater good of society? You have to decide for yourself. But for young people right now, it's a little weird. Because they actually did survive fine. And they are okay. And the chance that many, many young people get seriously sick from COVID is not like the chances of somebody who is elderly getting sick and getting COVID and getting really need to be in the hospital. So the decision isn't just about you. It's about how you're going to contribute to the society around you. And that's a really serious decision for a young person to make. And so, um, you know, there's so many different ways of thinking about it. And the bottom line is you have to sit with yourself and make an informed choice. The best choice for you is one that you make knowing what's in mind. That's good. I, I like it. since we're still on the topic of vaccine. I guess how can someone who has a vaccine yeah. still get COVID? Okay, so let's talk about it, right? How does it work? The way it works is it exposes your body to this protein, and then your body makes other proteins so that it can recognize, tag, and get rid of the virus if it shows up again. But there are a lot of things that got to go right for that to happen. Number one, what if you get slammed with so much virus up front, like someone with COVID sneezes in your face for three hours, right? Suddenly, your immune system is trying, but it just can't. There's not enough vouchers at the party. It's just it's like a zombie apocalypse, right? Right. So you like the load of virus you get makes a big difference in how sick you get, right? Um, and your immune system can only do but so much. That's why distance, masks, hygiene, and immune health are still critical, no matter if you get the vaccine or not. See, I would turn that around. I would say, I would say, not so much, if I can still get COVID after I get the vaccine, why would I bother with it? I would say, do you recognize how much COVID is still here? What are all of the things that you should still be thinking about and considering in your plan to be healthy so that you're not part of the COVID story going forward? The other way that you can end up getting um, the, the uh, infection is if, your immune system doesn't remember long enough, well enough. So there are studies that are going on now to figure out when is the best time to get another shot if you've made the decision to get vaccinated and you want to continue using that technique to support your immune system. For instance, the flu shot. We get one every year if we make that decision to make that part of our health. That's because the flu changes and our body forgets. So the reasons you can end up getting COVID is your immune system just didn't have a good enough response to it or there's something about COVID that tricked it. Um, we're organic, complicated people, you know? Your voice is different from mine, you know? Your eyes are different from mine. It's not necessarily a total one-size-fits-all. 
that's why we got to take these standard precautions and keep COVID under control and not just trust our immune system. It's a really, really, it's a really, really hard thing because we like answers where like, if you do this, then this happens. If you do this, then this happens. But we're organic people, you know? You might wake up in the morning with a plan to go run a 5K and you're tired. <laughs> you might decide you want pizza for dinner and then you go to eat a bite and you're like, oh, fool, I don't want this. You might make a plan to go watch a movie and you get there like, this is dumb. Like, things happen, right? And your body and your immune system really is no different. Yeah, um, I personally really love the analogies you use, like, a bouncer, and a zombie <laughs> apocalypse. Like I'm, I'm a very visual person, uh -huh. so it really helps me understand and paint a picture of my head. Yeah. But paint me this picture of how was a cure for COVID created so quickly, but not a cure for cancer? Oof, now that's a that's a that's a good one. I don't know if we have enough time for that one. <laughs> no, but that's some philosophical stuff. Let's let's first of all let's talk about it. Okay, cancer is a very complicated thing that is as human as breathing and heartbeats. Because cancer is this simply this. It's one of your cells going left when it should go right. I mean, it's basically part of you that because it's been traumatized or it just got some, <clears throat> something wrong with its own recipe, its own genetic code, or because of a family genetic history, that it, it, it wakes up one day and it says, I want to look like this instead of like that, and then suddenly it reproduces itself out of control or it doesn't grow right. or it, there's, It's a very complicated thing, but it's you. It's your body, and it is something that can happen because of a ton of different forces, whether they're from the outside or from the inside. COVID is a virus. And it's a virus in a family of viruses called coronavirus. And coronavirus has been around for a long time. It can also cause a cold or a simple upper respiratory infection. And so that is one organism outside of our bodies that was easy to put on a lab, in a lab, multiply it, poke it, study it, code it. You know, we can manipulate it. And so it's an infection rather than a new growth inside my, every individual's body. So I think the reason why, first of all, the science, right, the science of trying to make some way of fighting coronavirus moved quickly is that people and scientists have been studying coronavirus and these types of vaccines for, you know, 30 years. And so what we're seeing is the product, product a whole lot of work for a long time on a very specific problem, a viral infection. Now, the other side of it is we actually don't have a cure for COVID. We are the cure for COVID. In other words, this virus is on this planet now, you know? There's already an epsilon. I was reading about a lambda variant. I mean, we're just going to go down the whole Greek yeah. alphabet, right? Right. <laughs> like, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> So like it's got it like right so it's it's like it's on the planet now, just like um, there are other viruses that are on the planet now that you know we have to deal with. We got rid of a virus that causes smallpox for the most part, but how did that happen? Just because of perfect vaccinations or medical care? No, it's because of our behavior, our choices, and our public and communal well-being that we were able to get this under control. The the cure for COVID is us, and the way that we care for our bodies, and the way we care for one another. And so the same way I wear this mask, not for me, but for you, we have to think about whether or not we want to supercharge our immune systems to shut down COVID, not just for us, but for the communities that we're in. Very powerful, very powerful. And as we're talking about um, young people, and we understand that young people are better able to kind of fight the virus more than older people, but why has COVID disproportionately affected the black community mm. more than others? Like, that doesn't have to do nothing with immune system necessarily, does it? So, oof, good question. So first of all, there are two totally different answers, and it depends on sort of like, what frequency do we want to vibrate on on this? Do we want to vibrate on the individual human being risk factors that I hold in my body, that you hold in your body? 
certainly there's no genetic reason why COVID would occur more in people who are melanated. I mean, that's just BS, because that just doesn't exist anyway. Race is a social, social construct. So it's not a genetic reality, right? But the consequences of racism in the United States causes people of color and black people to carry a disproportionate amount of stress due to micro, macro, and structural aggression, right? What does that mean? Stress increases a hormone in our body called cortisol. You know what cortisol is? You know what steroids are? Yeah. Right? Okay. These are hormones in our body that are made for us to be able to fight, to be strong, and handle really serious situations. So when you're stressed, cortisol goes up. And it makes you basically, makes your sugar kind of go up, it kind of makes your, you know, that's what people take steroids to bulk up and stuff, right? Okay, so it's a stress hormone. Here's the thing, that same hormone is really, really good at shutting your immune system down. It's, if somebody has a problem with their immune system is overreacting, what do they take? Steroids, right? To shut it down. And so, I would say as a body of people, just that reality alone, right? creates a fundamental shift, right, in what it is to have an immune system that's healthy every day. And, and, and that's one, 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 one example of that. Then you have the bigger picture in which black bodies have been the subject of treatment for decades, mm -hmm. for centuries in this country, which have created um, a, 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 a a difference in the way people experience what they need to be well. So, things like housing, environment, uh, food access, um, things like that are, no matter, quite honestly, no matter what class someone might be, can still, ver is still fundamentally carried disproportionately in bodies of color, in black people, in the United States. And so, if you have uh, a virus, right, that thrives when your immune system can't fight it. If you have a virus that spreads through our social contact and we need and interact and move and play in ways that allow the virus to thrive, it is not surprising that that's happened. But there's a whole other level beyond that. And that's a much sort of scarier one, and for me as a physician, it's one I really grappled a lot in the pandemic, which is the way that systems of health care, right, are simply not historically nor currently structured to be free of the impact of racism, mm -hmm. right? And so everything from access to testing in the beginning, right, let's talk about it, right? People, you couldn't even get tests in the very beginning in a lot of North City and North County. People worked really hard to fix that. But they had to work hard to fix it because it wasn't just there, yeah. right? And so Prepare STL is actually an enormous focused effort of the city health department, in the county health department, in the regional health commission, in the integrated health network, in Alive and Well, in the Black Healers Collective, in the Community Health Worker Coalition, in my organization, the T, right? All these people who said, no, nah, we ain't doing it like that. We are going to intentionally redirect resources and the public health support to people of color in this city and in this region because we're not going to let the story play out that way. And I'm so proud. I mean, I'm just, I'm sure I'm getting real with it. I'm so proud to have been part of an effort that worked that hard to do something different and break that pattern. And, you know, it, it's amazing. It's everything from, you know, uh, a hormone circulating in our body to the impact of the zip code to the way Medicare and Medicaid are funded and everything in between. And, and unfortunately that has summed to a disproportionate burden of this disease and people of color in this city and region and it's one that I continue to fight against. In fact, can I do a plug? Can I do a real quick shameless plug? Okay, I've got I to gotta give a shameless plug. Tonight at Turner Park and tomorrow at Delwood Park, Prepare STL is holding a wellness summit. It's a summit where we're having outdoor events as well as online activities um, where we're trying to basically say, in the words of Rebecca Bennett, what doesn't heal spreads. 
And we want to be intentional about our healing as we move past this second year of COVID. So the Prepare SDL website has more information about that summit. I just had to plug that because yeah. that's where I'm going after we're done. I'm going yeah. on the block, so I'm excited about it. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Uh, no, that was very powerful. So basically, we have a choice. It's our choice. But at least we have the option to take care of our bodies, our immune health, and really just help ourselves, not just us, but other people around us. So it's a very pretty selfless act to do. But once again, that's your choice that you have to make. And anything else you'd like to say? Uh, it was really informative conversation overall. Great to address the uh, topics. You know, when you know, when you know, the more you know, and, and the more informed you are, and when you, when you know better, you choose better. Yeah. And, and what I want is for our young people to have access to the answers to their specific focused questions. Mm -hmm. Because it's real. COVID has not been experienced the same way in young bodies as it has been in bodies who have been on this planet longer. And so your perspective and your concerns are really important. Because I said this at an event the other day, and I'll say it again. Young people have the power to end this pandemic. And I want to do everything I can do to help them be able to do that in this region. Mm -hmm. Listen to your doctors. <laughs> Not your uncles. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Controversial, <laughs> but listen to doctors. <laughs> Like Dr. LJ Punch. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, hanging out with us on Facebook Live. Um, thank you, Azaria and Luke. This was really cool. And uh, um, if you're interested and you want to know more about all this, check out Prepare STL. Appreciate you.